Hardy and my name is Sarah Lynch and welcome to the Communications High School's Mock Election Official Debate. As I of the Inkblot, Sarah and I were selected to serve as the moderators for this debate. First of all, we would like to thank our committees, the Election Bureau, run by Julia Dwight and Mrs. Morgan, which organized voter, which will conduct the election on Tuesday, as well as Common Cause, which organized voter registration yesterday under Annie Roth's direction. See Mr. Roth or Mr. Godkin if you still need to register. We would also like to thank the students in Mrs. O'Keefe's third period history and film class for providing the candidates with research for their campaign, as well as Mrs. Molshine's news photography class for setting up the stage and all the decorations you see behind it. And lastly, we would like to thank the amazing Inkblot advisor, Mrs. Molshine, for all of her dedication for setting up this election season. All questions were student proposed based on the candidates' policies and past experience. The rules of the debate are as follows. One of us will pose a question to a specific candidate. The candidates will have one minute to respond. Ms. Ruroff and Ms. Dwight will keep time. A yellow paddle means the candidate has 20 seconds left, and a red paddle means that the candidate needs to stop talking immediately or finish their sentence. Once the candidate has completed their answer, the other candidates will be given one minute to respond. Also, please note that limited time only allows candidates to stick to relevant issues. Castigation of fellow candidates or policies is discouraged as it derails from the purpose of this debate. At the conclusion of the debate, each candidate will have one minute to make their closing statement. Follow us on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at the Inkblot News for updates and information about the debate and the election. The entire debate will be posted on the Inkblot YouTube and website by the end of the day. We would also like to ask our live audience to ensure that no clapping, cheering, or jeering occurs during the duration of the debate. You can only clap when we introduce the candidates and at the end of the debate. Now we will unveil our candidates. For the Constitution Party, please welcome Junior Matt Avina as Daryl Castle. simply should not be a barrier in getting a degree or any credential that you would want. And I have plans to make this a reality. So first I would refinance student loans at current rates. Refinancing the loans would help 25 million borrowers across the country, with the typical borrower saving $2,000 over the life of the loan. I would enroll in income-based repayment. Nobody should have to pay more than 10% of their monthly income for college debt. And the total debt should be forgiven after 20 years, 10 if they work in the public service. I will simplify, expand, and develop options for automatic enrollment in these programs to make it easy and simple for everyone to use. I will push employees to contribute to student debt relief. I will create a payroll deduction portal. And I will reward public service. AmeriCorps members who complete two years of national service and one year of public service will have their loans entirely forgiven. Okay, thank you, Secretary Clinton. 
Uh, Mr. Trump, your response. First of all, <laughs> it's huge, Jay. It's huge. The young people, they're undergoing a crisis. And honestly, it's not okay. Look, I know something about money. And we do not allow the government to profit from loans, okay? The Department of Education, look guys, they're stupid. They're stupid, they're not working. And I'm gonna get rid of them. We're going to help the young people pay off their loans at the outer degree plan. It's an income-driven repayment plan, one that all students will be able to afford. Students should not be asked to repay debts that their incomes cannot handle. <laughs> Dr. Stein, your response. Education is the cornerstone of our society, so we must make it accessible and fair to all students. I will implement tuition-free, high-quality education from preschool to university and eliminate student debt. Some might think this is a radical idea, how can you just eliminate a debt? Well, the Wall Street bailout was $17 trillion. If we found a way to bail out our criminals who crashed the economy and destroyed the lives of everyday Americans, then why is it so preposterous to eliminate the student debt, which is under $2 trillion? It seems like we only care about large institutions and less about everyday people. Our youth is our future. A society cannot survive if they destroy their younger generations. We need today's generation to be able to go out into the working world after college and be able to find somewhere to live and have a steady job. Just as a high, a high school education was essential for a young person's economic security in the 20th century, higher education is essential now in the 21st century. And it should be provided for free as well. Mr. Castle, your response. Well, I plan on being a real 10th Amendment president, and that means I will delegate all powers not listed in the Constitution as federal powers to the states and to the people. Well, nowhere in the Constitution does it mention the federal government's power to distribute student loans. We're going to make this a privatized thing, and once there's competition, uh, there's always improvement. So what's going to happen is private companies are going to lower interest rates as they strive to gain more loans. Over time, this is going to make the interest rates on loans go down dramatically, and it's also going to increase the percentage of money that colleges receive. And along, well, in a short time, this will improve us because the, we'll be going to college before I'm elected. So, thank you. Mr. Johnson, your response. Um, well, I do believe that in society, is, it's a monumentally big problem, the, uh, the amount of college debt among students that has arisen over time, and I do agree that we should lower interest rates, which would slowly minimize this debt among the entire country, um, especially with federal student loans, and that it should be privatized, uh, the amount of loans that are given away to these students. Um, I also do believe in uh, eventually, possibly, abolishing the Department of Education and their involvement in this. Um, a common defense for the Department of Education is that it was founded by George Washington, one of our founding fathers. Um, and we should keep it because, you know, he knew his virtues and he knew what was important for us as a country. And that's not true. It wasn't actually um, started by George Washington. It was started by Jimmy Carter. And, I mean, what improvements have there been in public education since the 1980s? Um, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Trump, the next question is for Mr. Trump. On your campaign website, you have a 10-point plan to approach illegal immigration. You want to build a wall at the Mexican border. Please comment on that plan and by extension your plans concerning Syrian refugees. Thank you. Uh, on the first day of my presidency, we will begin to build that wall. Let me just say, it will be beautiful. Mexico will pay for it. Listen, we have a tremendous amount of people coming into our country every day. And it's all illegal. They're bringing crime, they're breaking the law and we need to instate law and order. We're not tough enough, nobody will cross it. If I build a wall, nobody will cross it. And guess what? Guess what? It's going to be huge, okay? It's gonna be huge. And listen, as for the Syrian refugees, we have no idea who these people are. They have no record, and as I've said before, I'm calling for a complete shutdown of Muslims entering this country. Why would we allow crooked Hillary to handle this when she and Barack Obama helped create the vacuum that in the Middle East that created ISIS. Listen, these refugees will bring ISIS to this country and we can't allow that. We need to keep America safe. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stein, your response? We must halt deportations of undocumented but otherwise law-abiding immigrants that are tearing families apart. Passing harsh anti-immigration laws is not the answer. In Alabama, the tomato industry collapsed by billions when they passed harsh immigration laws that caused immigrants to leave town. They are just as vital to our economy as anyone else. This is not a radical notion. We should be providing a clear legal pathway and citizenship for immigrants. 
We need to be clear that our jobs went overseas due to NAFTA and other free trade agreements. The spike in undocumented immigrants occurred after NAFTA put millions of small farmers out of business, so people were forced to migrate here as economic refugees hoping to feed their families. So first, we must fix the economic problems that are driving in immigrants into this country, caused by our own trade policies and destabilization of their governments. Then we can provide the pathway to citizenship. Mr. Castle? Well, I agree with some of the statements that Donald Trump just made. We do need to secure our borders. What's a country without a borders? The answer is nothing. But I differ with some of the reasons why. Donald Trump is running a campaign based on his own morals and beliefs. However, I'm running one based on the Constitution. The Constitution does not say that we must grant citizenship to people who come here legally. Instead, that's unconstitutional. Why, when people are waiting for 10, 20 years just to grant legal citizenship, would you grant amnesty to people who broke the law to come here illegally? Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Well, to start off, a little known fact is that I was um, a two-term governor of New Mexico, which has one of the longest borders um, with Mexico out of uh, any state compared with Texas. Um, and uh, um, I have probably the most experience with Border Patrol than any of the other four candidates um, up on stage. Um, I believe that the process of vetting immigrants coming to this country um, from South America isn't just as simple as building a wall or offering amnesty to people who have already come in here and we just don't want to take the time to document. There has to be a more complicated, a more complicated vetting process that, where we could work out all the specific details of who they are, where they came from, why they're here, and I think um, overall, the more time we take on this, and the more especially we treat it, the better it's going to be for the people who actually decide to come here and work as American citizens. Secretary Clinton. From the beginning of our country, America has stood as a beacon of hope, safety, and security for people all around the world. And today, in our turbulent times, we have more people than ever looking for those values. Um, so while I agree that we need immigration reforms, we need serious vetting and background checks, we need to make it accessible to people. We need to have open plans to citizen, citizenship that are easy, um, simple, and we need to keep families together. So many people, so many citizens of the United States are born here, and their parents are faced with the task of either staying, are we going to get deported? These hardworking Americans who are contributing to our society worry, think, worry about their families every day, and we need to keep them together. Thank you, candidates. The next question is directed for Dr. Stein. Among other things, the grants and low-income loans will be granted to green businesses and co-ops. Um, a common rebuttal against renewable energy is that it will cause many Americans in fuel industries to lose jobs and money. I will not let that happen. Instead, any worker who works in the fossil fuel industry will receive a pension once the U.S. fully transitions into using green energy. And with my plan, we will depend upon 100% renewable energy by 2030. Mr. Castle, your response. Well, like I said in my first response, I will be a true 10th Amendment president. Nowhere in the Constitution is the federal government given the right to regulate the environment. And although it does look as though there's climate change and that it is human caused, we, do sim we simply do not have the power to regulate private businesses. All it's going to do is hurt the economy and hurt our financial system in the long run. So in conclusion, I do believe in climate change. However, I do not support federally funded actions into stopping it. Mr. Johnson. I do believe um, that uh, the environment is facing a huge problem. There is a deterioration in the health of all the nature around us in our country and around the world. Uh, I don't believe um, that the government has or should have the ability to tax uh, carbon emissions harshly. Um, I think that it should be up to uh, the people of the United States to exercise their independent wills and come together as a community to help better the environment. Um, I, as a governor, I supported the state revolving loan fund for flexible clean water. Um, I care about the environment. I think that we should take measures to um, put it in the hands of the people uh, to clean up uh, sites on the NPL, the national priorities list, um, the really bad places where we need to clean up, and also um, some of the brownfields of the United States, which, were, um, which was space that was rented out by industrial complexes used and then thrown away when they didn't need it anymore. 
Secretary Clinton. Climate change is a very real problem, and I've laid out bold national goals to help address these threats. As president, I believe saying no to drilling in the Arctic, saying no to tax giveaways for big oil and gas companies. I want to have half a billion solar panels in the US by 2020, and I want us to generate enough renewable electricity to power every home in America. I want to invest in clean energy, which will also create clean energy jobs that will create, um, that will help America become the world's clean energy superpower. Our children's future is dependent, depend on it after all. Mr. Trump. Just Stein, Hillary Clinton. Look, you're both great, great women, especially you, Hillary Clinton, you're great women. But I'm sorry, we have way more important things to talk about. Right now, we are facing ISIS, we are facing Russia, China. Uh, listen, the climate goes up. The climate goes down. It'll get cooler, it'll get warmer. But you know what it's called? It's called weather. Okay. <laughs> I'm making such a big deal about this. And I think we have many issues facing our country and much more important things to talk about. The next question is for Errol Aspen. You have stated that you are a religious man. Describe your stance on the separation of church and state. Well, yes, I am very religious and I do believe in God. This has shaped many of my own morals and beliefs. However, my own beliefs will not influence my politics. I believe in a strict adherence to the Constitution, and this does not leave room for politicians to insert what they think. I'm not running for president so I can bring my ideals to a national level. Instead, I'm running for president to uphold the law of our land and to uphold the rights of each and every citizen of the United States of America. And the first right granted in the Bill of Rights starts off by saying, quote, the United, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So, to answer your question, I do believe in separation of church and state. However, I see nothing wrong with practicing law, practicing politics, and practicing religion simultaneously. Mr. Johnson, your response? Um, I believe that in this country we have to find a balance between religious liberty and freedom from discrimination. Um, people's religion shouldn't take a place in their personal decisions, or their business decisions, or decisions in education for that matter. Uh, for example, it, it might be in the religious beliefs of a, a businessman to refuse service to a homosexual in marital ceremonies, but this is infringing upon the free and happy life of that person um, that's simply trying to exercise their right to express love in their community. Um, to an extent, of course, it, everyone should be able to enjoy their own religion. That is what this country was founded upon. But when it interferes with the happiness of someone else, uh, measures need to be taken to ensure that no one is harming anyone else because of their religion. Secretary Clinton. Our wonderful country was built and founded on the idea of religious freedom, where no one should feel oppressed, discriminated against for what they believe in. And every person should have the right to their own religious beliefs, uh, but the government should not be tied to any religious affiliation. Thank you. Mr. Trump. I am a religious man. I've said this many times before. My very book is the Bible. I went to Sunday school. On the dollar bill, it says, in God, we trust. In the Pledge of Allegiance, it says, under God. Church and state are separate, of course, but we are a God-loving country, and religion is very important. We can't lose sight of our roots in Christianity, and we can't end our support for Israel. I support Israel, I support Netanyahu, and I love the Bible. But I also love the Constitution, and it says we need a separation of church and state. So I think there should definitely be a balance. Dr. Stein, your response? We don't live in a religious country in the sense of having no national religion and instead the separation of church and state. So faith should not be a public issue. But yes, it tends to be something that people are interested in. I'm not comfortable with any narrow religious or secular view of the world. Religious societies where religion is enshrined in government are extremely problematic. I respect every faith and look for a moral and ethical foundation of how society works but that is independent of faith or whether one has a religion at all. And that needs to be reflected in our government. Failing to separate church and state is a bad prescription. The next question is for Mr. Johnson. On June 26, 2015, gay marriage was legalized in the United States under the Obama administration and backed by the Supreme Court. Do you agree or disagree with the concept of gay marriage rights? I am a firm supporter of marriage equality, period. Government, under no circumstances, should be able to put restrictions on the personal relationships of citizens. The plain hard fact 
is that any unfair treatment of an American because of their race, religion, sexuality, or gender, or gender identity is an infringement upon the personal liberties of that American. I mean, in my eyes, discrimination involving gays is just the same as discrimination involving racial minorities. This new epidemic of aversion towards homosexual rights that we face is just another form of the African American civil rights movement in, in this decade. It's just another issue in which we simply need to accept people for who they are. Secretary Clinton. LGBT plus rights are human rights. All persons should be able to live a life with dignity, secure, security, and respect, regardless of who they are or who they love. The US Supreme Court's ruling on marriage equality represents America at its best, just, fair, and moving forward towards equality. But we still have more work to do. I'll ensure that LGBT plus Americans have full equality under the law and end discrimination in employment, schools, and all aspects of social life. I will continue to stand for the LGBT plus community around the world in efforts to fight any nation on, that are infringing on their rights or their, um, what am I trying to say here, <laughs> on their ignoring their rights or abuse. People are people, after all, and we deserve to be treated as such. Mr. Trump. I am for judicial marriage, but I believe that the decision should be up to the states. Look. I'm not against gay rights. Ask for the gays. They love me. <laughs> not so much. But it should be up to the states to decide. I'm all for state rights. It's in our constitution. Look, people, I think the Supreme Court will overstep their boundaries. If I was president, I would overturn it and leave it up to the states. Dr. Stein. Gay people deserve the same rights as everyone else. Period. I don't even see why this is controversial. We must protect, protect the LGBT community from discrimination. In my first run for office in 2002, I was for ma marriage equality, not just civil unions. I was the first pro-gay marriage candidate in the first state to make it law. It wasn't until years later that the Democratic Party changed their view on the issue. Vice President Joe Biden broke the ice on the issue in 2012 by saying he was comfortable with it, but by that time it was already a major political issue. The point being, I believe in doing what's right even when it's not popular. We must be about freedom for everyone. It's the law of the land. Businesses are public entities, and they must abide by the law, so therefore any discrimination against the LGBT community is a violation of not only the law, but of human rights. Mr. Castle. Well, I find it terrible and unconstitutional that gay marriage was ever illegal. Look, nowhere in the Constitution is the federal government granted the right to infringe on the social life of uh, American citizens. What two consenting adults want to do together is their own business, and the government should not step in. So I do support gay marriage. The next question is for Secretary Clinton. You mentioned on Equal Pay Day your feelings towards the wage gap between men and women in the workforce. Do you recognize the wage gap? And if so, how would you close this gap? Well, there is certainly no doubt that the wage gap exists. Women, as a broad statement, make $76 for every dollar. 76 cents, excuse me, for every dollar that a man makes. That was quite wrong. Um, and women of color are often even more effective. Black women making around 60 cents and Latino women making around 55 cents for every dollar. So yes, I recognize it. But what we need is stricter transparency laws to ensure men and women are paid equally for the same jobs. I'm a proponent of the $15 minimum wage, which will help increase the quality of life for all Americans. These hardworking American women, some of them, uh, that was very wrong. <laughs> Excuse me. These hardworking American women in the service industry, which composed about two thirds of them, are sometimes being paid as little as two dollars an hour and relying on uh, tips to get by on life, and this is absolutely unacceptable. I will fight with every ounce I have to ensure equal pay. I will fight to close the wage gap, and I will fight for women all over America. Mr. Trump, your response. In my company. We, we just made billions of dollars, I'll tell you. It's made billions of dollars. We pay everyone equally. End of story. I pay everyone equally. I believe in equal pay. That's just who I am. I'm the most generous person. The most. And I pay everyone equally. That's just the end of it. <laughs> My power to the people plan creates deep system change, moving from the greed and exploitation of corporate capitalism to a human-centered economy that puts all people, peace, and planet over profit. This plan will end unemployment and poverty, avert climate catastrophe, build a sustainable, just eco economy, and recognize the dignity and human rights of everyone in our society and our world. 
The power to create this new world is not in our hopes, it's not in our dreams, it's in our hands. Mr. Castle. Well, I do recognize that there is a wage gap. The numbers show that women are paid less for every dollar that a man receives. However, this is not the federal government's responsibility. I do extremely morally suppose, uh, oppose businesses um, paying women less just because of their gender. However, it is something that they are legally allowed to do. Businesses are allowed to pay the wages that they see as fit. And yes, that means that I do not support a minimum wage. Uh, Clinton supports a $15 minimum wage. All this will do is destroy small businesses and make it so that new small businesses aren't able to uh, start. This will just stagnate our economy. So in conclusion, it's not the federal government's, it's not in the federal government's power. Mr. Johnson. Well, simply put, um, extra interference in, in business is just too much complication in a matter that is already extensively complicated. The government should not make any decisions involving employees' pay in private businesses because gender is not the only deciding factor. There's also education, experience, tenure, and every single case is completely unique to that person who is being hired. Um, it is the business with the business. It's all a matter of individual communication. It has nothing to do with the federal government. The businesses are definitely discouraged strongly from any sort of discrimination because of gender, race, or any of the other factors that could separate one group of people from another group of people. But it is their decision and not the government's. Secretary Clinton. I believe I answered this. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Mr. Trump, the next question is for you. Sorry, Secretary. In the 1973 decision, Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court held that a woman's right to an abortion fell under the 14th Amendment. What are your personal views on abortion rights, and what would you do as the president to push your view? Well, first of all, I'm pro-life. Uh, I'm okay with abortion if there's been a rape or incest or if it endangers the life of the mother. But I am pro-life, and as president, I would stop government funding for abortions, and I would defund Planned Parenthood. Look, right now, abortion is a disaster. You can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month on the final day. On the final day, look, it's a disaster. We need to fix it, and I will fix it. Dr. Stein, it is essential that the option of a safe, legal abortion remains available. The morning after pill must be affordable and easily access accessible without a prescription, together with a government-sponsored public relations campaign to educate women about this form of birth control. Clinics must be accessible and must offer advice on contraception and the means for it, consultation about abortion and the performance of abortions, and abortion regardless of age or marital status. Mr. Castle. I am pro-life, but not because of my own beliefs, but because of the Constitution. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments grant that life, liberty, and property are for every citizen of the United States, and the Constitution never specifies at what stage of pregnancy a baby is considered a human. We must therefore assume that it's from conception, meaning that abortion would be considered murder. So I am pro-life. Mr. Johnson. Well, I am definitely pro-choice. Um, I believe, again, my entire philosophy of government is that the government should do as little as possible to infringe upon the personal rights of citizens of the United States. So I do believe um, that even though I completely value the potential life of an unborn fetus, I think that it is a woman's decision um, whether or not to have a baby. I do not claim, uh, at any point have I ever claimed, or on any level do I claim that I know the situation of a woman who may have a baby better than she does. I believe in uh, abortions up to the point of viability of the fetus because that can be considered infanticide. Um, I, uh, I just I think that it should be well known that it's a citizen's right to choose what to do with their body in any sense, and abortions obviously count as one of the senses of what to do with your body. Secretary Clinton. I believe unequivocally that every woman should have access to quality reproductive health care services, including safe and legal abortion regardless of where she lives, how much money she makes, or how she is insured. I condemn and will combat any acts of violence, harassment, and intimidation of, reproduct of reproductive health providers, patients, and staff. I will defend Planned Parenthood. I have supported them for many long years. And as president, I will always support them. Politicians have no business interfering with one of the hardest decisions a woman may have to make in her life. We need to think about the health the physical, the emotional, the financial health of the mother 
and the government should not have the power to regulate abortions. The next question is for Dr. Stein. Crime in the United States has garnered a significant amount of media attention in recent years. Racial profiling and police brutality are just two issues that often arise in debates about U.S. crime. Activists and police officers across the country have been fighting for solutions to this problem. What do you believe is the source of this conflict and what is your solution? Our criminal justice system is broken and must be fixed. Not only am I not afraid to say Black Lives Matter, but I will actually act on my convictions and call for immediate change. We must fight against predatory mass incarceration. Roughly one in three black men alive today will be in prison within their lifetime. I will decriminalize marijuana. No one should go to jail for something as minuscule as smoking pot. In general, substance abuse should be treated as a medical issue as opposed to a criminal one. I demand readily available full-time investigation committees for communities to examine all cases of death and serious injury in police custody. We must retrain police officers in conflict resolution in order to limit use of force, enforce the usage of body cameras, and end policing quotas and racial profiling. Mr. Castle? Well, there is a problem, and the numbers do show it. However, this is a problem that is up to the states. Police forces are run by states and by local governments, not by the federal government. By us administering uh, and telling them what they should do, that's unconstitutional. I do encourage states to uh, put measures in to try to end things like racial profiling and police brutality. However, it's not in the federal government's power to dictate what states and what local governments can do. Mr. Johnson. Well, to start off, I, uh, I oppose hate crime laws. Uh, I think that it's unconstitutional to um, bring a punishment to someone for something that you think they intended to do rather than the actual crime they committed. So if I throw a brick through someone's window and they happen to be an African-American person, don't punish me because they were African-American because you think that that's why I was committing the crime. Punish me for destruction of property because I threw a brick through their window. <laughs> um, secondly, I also uh, oppose the stop and frisk um, method of, uh, of, of police in New York City. Um, which is basically where a police officer can stop any pedestrian on the street and, and search them for weapons. Americans believe the Constitution and the, protect and the protections it's supposed to provide. Um, I think that definitely infringes upon the individual rights given by uh, citizens uh, in the Constitution because you can't just stop someone and search their being for something you think they might have. Secretary Clinton. I believe that we must rebuild the bond of trust between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. Everyone in America should respect the law, and the law should respect everybody in America. We need to implement strategies like police body cameras, and investing in situation de-escalation training for officers, and create national guidelines for the appropriate use of force. And we need to invest in education, because education is the basis of a better quality of life. And if there's a better quality of life, it's been shown that the crime rates are, you know, lower. So that's what I propose. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Trump, your response. There has been so much crime this year. Inner city crime is reaching record levels. There is so much violence, and it's because we're lacking law and order. I've said it many times, we need law and order. We have gangs, drug dealers, riots, mass employment, poverty, huge problems created by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Look, I will bring jobs back to the cities and make them great again. I'm looking to the crowd right now, and I see so many black people, and they all <laughs> they all agree with me. And they know inner city lives are terrible. They can walk through the front door and get shot. <laughs> Huge problem. There's so many riots, and it's not helping at all. We need love and order. The next question is for Mr. Castle. The Constitution Party's platform states that the Federal Department of Education and its programs, including No Child Left Behind and Common Core, should be eliminated. What would be the end goal of this move, and what would you what would happen to ease the, tra the transition? Well, yes, my party's platform, and indeed that of my own, hold that we should eliminate the Department of Education and all subsequent programs. This stems from our belief in a strict adherence to the Constitution. 
The Tenth Amendment states that all rights and powers not granted to the federal government must be delegated to the states and to the people. And education is never mentioned in the Constitution. By getting rid of systems like Common Core, Race to the Top, and No Child Left Behind, we will let the states and local governments decide the curriculum. After all, they are the ones who know what it takes to be successful in their own communities. Most importantly, under my presidency, we will not federally administer standardized testing or give any incentives for states to administer standardized testing. This means that under my presidency, students will be prepared for the real world and learn how to become successful adults instead of learn and practice how to sit behind a desk and take a standardized test. Mr. Johnson. Every school is different, like every person is different. We all grow up, we have different jobs, we live in different places, we know different people. So every situation that we come to, we have to adapt in a different way. Things like the Common Core, they're trying to make a uniform system for every, every single student to abide by. And I think that the fact that we're judging every single kid on the same basis, uh, trying to um, judge them on the same level of ability for the exact same skill, I don't think that's really measuring their worth in this environment. Because uh, I might be good at math and you might be good at science, but there's no science section on the park. Um, I think that uh, we should have no common core, which is uh, trying to, again, make a uniform system for the entire states. Um, I also believe in vouchers, um, which can uh, uh, move someone who is not happy with their school or their school district or their education they are getting to a place where they can succeed on their own personal level. Secretary Clinton. Yes. Education should be the great door opener, and yet we often see that it doesn't turn out that way. As president, I plan to ensure that every child from every zip code has access to world-class education, including access to college all the way down to preschool. We need to strike the right balance between standardized testing, making them fair, fewer, and better for elementary and secondary students. And we have to support the teachers. We need teacher training, and we need resources for teachers in order to pre prepare today's youth for their bright future. Education is a key to a better quality of life, and we need to have the highest class education in America. Mr. Trump? I actually agree with Gary Johnson and Daryl Castle. Uh, Common Core must be eliminated. Look, it's a disaster. My friend, good friend, huge friend, Chris Christie, was originally for it. <laughs> he helped get it into New Jersey, but now he's against it. And he's against it because he sees it for what it is, federal overreach. I want local schools and quality education for the United States. Education is very important to me, so much that I started my own university, Trump University, it's very successful. <laughs> We're right now losing to third world countries. This is not okay, it's ridiculous. We need to get our grades up, but Common Core is not the solution to that. I think Washington DC deciding the curriculum for the entire country is ridiculous. We need a better system. Dr. Stein. I agree that Common Core must be eliminated and No Child Left Behind should be repealed as well. I believe Common Core should be replaced with curriculums developed by educators, not corporations, with input from communities. Relying on high stakes tests puts teachers working in low-income communities at risk. Students in low-income income communities do not always have access to the same level of education as those at more pri privileged schools. By using these tests as a standard for graduation, we are denying students their diploma based on a situation they can't control. The federal policy on education should only act to provide equal access to a quality education. We must oppose the administration of public schools by private for-profit entities. If we want to continue to value education as a human right, we must, we must actually treat it as one. Thank you, candidates. This question is directed at Gary Johnson. The Second Amendment is a significant part of the Bill of Rights, which was established over 235 years ago. As the times have changed, death by firearms have increased immensely in this country. Is it time for the right to bear arms to be changed? Well, gun control is a very fragile issue today, especially because of all the tragedies happening as a result of terrorism in our country and others in the world. Uh, many people see that taking firearms away from the public is a means of reducing violence as they see a correlation between the presence of guns and a higher death toll. Um, the reality is, is that if the federal government sends out a mandate to turn in all guns, let's just say that there's two people in the world, two types of gun owners, malicious gun owners, 
and benevolent gun owners, gun owners who would use the guns to protect themselves, and people um, who are very outnumbered by, um, by the good people anyway, who would uh, use their guns for bad purposes, like potential terrorists. If you send out a mandate to turn in all guns, the good people are going to be the ones who are listening to the laws and turning in their guns, and the bad people, they're not going to listen to the laws. So if you send out a mandate to turn in all guns, the only people who will have guns are the terrorists, which will make these occurrences of mass shootings even more common than they are today. Secretary Clinton. Hello Americans, fellow people, it's time to act. While responsible gun ownership is a part of the fabric of many communities in our country, Simply too many families have suffered from gun violence. I support comprehensive background checks and will continue to fight uh, for coming sense reforms to keep guns away from terrorists, domestic abusers, and other violent criminals. And as president, I will do everything in my power to mitigate the violence caused by guns each year. I plan to build on the success of the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. We need to keep weapons of war, like assault weapons, and large capacity ammunition magazines off of our streets. We've come a long way since the Second Amendment, Amendment was written, and we need to modernize along with our times. Mr. Trump, your response? Uh, I'm completely for the Second Amendment. I'm a huge supporter of the right to bear arms. Some candidates, I'm not naming names, but Hillary Clinton, <laughs> want to destroy the Second Amendment. But look, I'm serious about getting criminals off the streets. We need to make our community safer, we need to make our city safer, and we need to empower gun owners to defend themselves. I'll tell you, the NRA endorsed me faster than they endorsed anyone before. We need safety. Dr. Stein, response. <laughs> there are tragedies every day where young people are being shot as victims, of, as victims of gun crimes. It's tragic. We're not arguing that nobody should have a gun, but public safety should factor into constraints. We certainly need an assault weapons ban, but we need more than that. There are some 260 people every day who are injured or killed by gun violence. So it's very important that we ban assault weapons. Local communities need to be able to regulate guns. We need to keep guns out of the hands of criminals. We need background checks so that the mentally ill are not possessing or using guns. We need to end the gun show loopholes as well because there's far too much violence from guns which is not needed. And we need to end the culture of drug violence which is also a major driver of drug crimes. So that means legalizing marijuana because it is a substance which is dangerous because it is illegal but it's actually far less dangerous than other legal substances. Mr. Castle, your response. The Second Amendment states that all United States citizens have the right to bear arms. There is no buts, there is no asterisk, only the right to bear arms. Placing any restrictions on guns or the purchase or manufacture thereof is unconstitutional. We are hurting businesses by restricting what things they can manufacture, and we are hurting the individual rights of every citizen of the United States. So I do not support um, any restrictions for guns. For the final question before closing statements, we will give each candidate one minute to respond to the following question. We will start on the left-hand side with Mr. Castle and work our way down the line, ending with Dr. Stein. The final question is, do you feel you're modeling appropriate behavior for today's youth? Well, right now, there's been a lot of scandals occurring with the two major party candidates, and a lot of people are looking for a morally upstanding citizen to run as a third party candidate. Here I am. <laughs> I have three separate degrees from universities. I served in the Marines for four years, reaching the rank of first lieutenant, and I practiced private law for 25 years. I've even been happily married for 38 years, something that not everyone up here knows about. <laughs> so, in conclusion, I practice respect, good morals, and throughout my whole life, I've made sure to try to make, treat everyone the way that I'd like to be treated. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Uh, well, I think that I'm 100% setting a good example for today's youth through the values and virtues of our libertarian campaign. The entire idea that the Libertarian Party was uh, built around is that people deserve independence in making their own decisions, and we're fighting for that as a measure to secure the prosperous and free future of this country so that children and their children and their children all have the ability to control their own fate. But looking past our motives as a party, the usage of libertarianism, of libertarianism today in mainstream media, it will benefit American youth because uh, these young men and women um, 
we're letting them know that making your own life choices is the, is the societally correct thing to do. And it brings about the thought in these young men and women that says, hey, I live in a place where you're supposed to be the one who decides what's what in your life instead of having someone else do it for you. And through this, these kids will begin to make their own choices and learn early on that responsibility is a primary duty and not just an option. Secretary Clinton. Do I model appropriate behavior for today's youth? Well, back in the 1970s, I was working with the Children's Defense Fund to take on discrimination against African American kids in schools. In the 1980s, I was working hard to reform schools in Arkansas. In the 1990s, I went to Beijing to fight for women's rights. I helped 9-11 responders receive the health care that they needed. I have fought for LGBT plus rights both at home and abroad. I support and stand by Planned Parenthood for a healthier future. I believe that each of us, our greatest monument on this earth, won't be what we build, but the lives we touch. So, to answer your question, Julia and Sarah, yes, I believe I am modeling appropriate behavior for today's youth. Mr. Trump. I want to make America great again. Okay, that's the plan. This is an amazing country. I've met so many great people, and there's just so many problems. Obamacare is a failure. Healthcare is going up by astronomical numbers. When I look at the Iran deal, we're giving back $150 billion to a terrorist state. That's a tremendous amount. And we made them a strong country. That was us. When I look at all the problems our country has, we have so much potential. And by trying to fix the problems in our country, I do think I'm setting a good example. Look, Hillary Clinton is a nasty woman. Nasty woman. <laughs> a liar. And she can't be trusted. I can fix this country. Dr. Stein, if there is no youth, there is no future. I am trying to help the youth by getting rid of college debt. I do not want to weigh anyone down. I want to uplift the youth. My biggest scandal is being in a folk band, for God's sake. I am a well-educated woman with a degree from Harvard University. I am a role model for young boys and girls who will hopefully realize that they are the future. Thank you, candidates. We would now like to move on to starting with Dr. Stein and working our way to the left, ending with Mr. Castle. Donald Trump talks a lot about making America great again, but in truth, America was never perfect. Our founding fathers had slaves, our grandparents lived in tenements, children worked in sweatshops, and today- We need an outsider, not so a part of the corruption. My message from the beginning is that we have to make America great again. A vote for me is a vote for America's prosperity. Thank you. Secretary Clinton. When you think of who to vote for on this election day, I want you to think of what you stand for. I want you to think of where you want this country to go. I've been privileged to see the presidency as a first lady, and I know the awesome responsibility of protecting our great nation. I made the cause of children and families my life's work, and I will stand up for the people against powerful interests, against corporations. I will do everything in my power to assure new prosperous jobs for our nation, and I will make sure that the future has a good, fair education system from preschool all the way into the working world. And I hope that you'll give me the chance to be president. So when you're at the ballots on Tuesday, vote for experience, vote for hope, vote for a better future, vote for Hillary Clinton. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. I believe as a libertarian, that the purpose of the federal government is not to give you what you want, but instead to create the legislation that gives you the ability to get what you want for yourself. There's a saying that fits this message, one of the most widely known expressions ever created. I know you all know it. It's, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man a fish, you feed him for his lifetime. We shouldn't be electing government officials to get us things we want, money, land, safety, success, happiness. Uh, we should be electing them to decrease their own involvement in our lives so we can reach our goals efficiently. A person's life is so much less productive if we have to ask for permission every time we want to do something. Don't make me come to you as an American citizen to get what I want. Just get rid of any restrictions barring what I want so I can get them for myself. Your future is what really matters. Let's give government Let's, give, let's get government out of your cell phone, out of your pocketbook, out of your bedroom, out of your life. Vote libertarian for a life of liberty and for a life of freedom from oppression. Thank you.
Mr. Castle. Well, I would like to start off by thanking Ms. Party and Ms. Lynch for moderating the debate, and for Ms. Dwight and Ms. Ruoff for keeping time. I'd like to thank the students and staff of Communications High School for attending, and I'd like to thank the Together for America United Today Now Political Action Campaign for their kind endorsement. You will find Joseph Sony. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a crazy election. There's been scandal after scandal thrown around, and many people are turning to third-party candidates. I'm very honored to be on this debate stage, and I'm very honored to be on the ballot in New Jersey. As I mentioned previously, if there's one word that can describe me, it's respect. I respect the Constitution. I respect our country. I respect the states. I respect the communities. But most importantly, I respect the individual right of every citizen of the United States of America. We're heading down a dark path. Our politicians in Washington are overstepping their powers, and they're stealing the rights from the American people. This is, by definition, unconstitutional. I promise to fight for your rights and regain everything that was promised to you in the Constitution. In the Constitution, excuse me. When you have the ballot on Tuesday, remember, vote for your states, vote for your communities, vote for yourselves, vote for Daryl Castle. Thank you to all of our candidates for their hard work and dedication in preparing for this debate. We would like to remind everyone that the election is Tuesday, and hopefully this debate gave you a good idea if you'd like to vote for. Thank you and have a good weekend.